How many of you have listened to the Head, Heart, and Boots podcast? I can't tell you that react how much that means to us. Yeah. Welcome back to the Head, Heart, and Boots podcast. I'm Chris. And I'm Brandon. Join us as we wrestle with what it takes to transform ourselves and the businesses we lead. This new camera angle makes my arms look smaller than yours. I'm noticing that and I really appreciate it. I thought you did that on purpose. No, I, I don't. I didn't. And I, I am not happy with it. Okay. Hey, welcome to the show, Tim. Thanks, Chris. Nice to have you on Head, Heart, and Boots podcast. Uh, I've, I've been excited about this chat, as I mentioned before we got on the call. Um, you and I have known each other for a very long time. I don't, I don't really know the kind of genesis point. I think it was probably some Chamber of Commerce meeting way, yep. way, way back uh, when I was a State Farm guy, is, is my guess. Uh, yeah, way back. I would guess well over 20 years. I don't, wow. think, I don't think I tried to sell knives to you uh, that far back. I didn't try to sell you Cutco knives, did I? You did not, but another guy with a beard that looks similar to yours has tried to sell me knives. Maybe, maybe it's like a prereq. You, in order to sell knives, you've got to have a, a, a badass beard. I don't know, but uh, no, you've yeah. never tried to sell me Cutco. Uh, beard sell, bro. I, I, don't, I don't know what it is. Um, they, they create comfort <laughs> and uh, approachability. That's right. I think is what happens. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Well, I wanted, okay, so let me unpack a little bit where this came from because uh, rather out of the blue, I think I texted you and was like, dude, I'd love to have you on the podcast. And if I recall correctly, we, um, uh, I was invited on a podcast and I'm pretty sure he said something, uh, maybe it was Jeff Silverman. I, I don't know who I was talking to, but I was talking to somebody and they mentioned your training facility. Oh, yeah. uh, that you had developed uh, sometime somewhat recently, or I imagine it's probably been an evolution, you know, over the last many years, but mm -hmm. uh, your training system. And that that's such a hot topic in the world that we operate in is how to um, how to onboard uh, frontline labor technicians, uh, et cetera, um, how to train them up as quickly as possible. It's getting so hard to find frontline labor, regardless of what service sector you're in. Yep. Um, and how do you retain people? And, and that, uh, reminded me of when Brandon and I came and visited, uh, your shop at, um, a chamber event that you guys hosted and you have this really amazing headquarters, uh, off of the freeway there with, uh, gosh, foosball tables and big screen projector TV thingy and like this whole hangout area for your employees. And, and so we were impressed by that, but I just thought this training topic and, how you, it sounded like you have some sort of testing system before people start working in the field and so forth. So I really, uh, uh, that's kind of where I wanted to hang out uh, a bit if you're open to that. Um, yeah, 100%. Yeah, so, okay, so before we dive into that, I guess maybe walk us up to that. Your 30-year anniversary is this year, 2024, is that right? This year, 30 years in business. Yeah, I was I was nine years old when I started. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I was 19. I was 19 years old when I started. So I just had my 49th birthday and uh, started. Uh, I called myself Tim Fitzpatrick Contract Painting and Roofing back in 1994. Mm -hmm. um, and I obviously hung up the roofing part. And then uh, in 2000, I was married to Kelly in 99. And uh, we moved to Phoenix and I had a goal and I'm kind of, I'm kind of squirrel ran right in front of me. Yeah. So I'm just kind of totally diverting here, but I had a goal of having a painting company in Phoenix during the winter months and Oregon during the summer. So I got my contractor's license in Phoenix, beating the streets, like literally beating the streets, hitting the streets, going door to door. I mean, you name it, I was doing it, picking up the phones, cold calling, had the, the yellow pages that was like this thick. And I'd sit in our two bedroom apartment and just go through the yellow pages and call property management companies and, you know, started drumming up work and, and hired my first employee. And then our, our, our daughter, Kate, who's now 23 years old, she was born in Phoenix. And after she was born, Kelly and I decided, you know what, we don't want to raise our kids in Phoenix. So we moved back to Oregon. Um, but going back and then we started kind of started hitting it really hard and treating it like a real business in 2001, 2002. And I didn't know what I was doing. I had no business schooling, no background. It's just kind of uh, shooting from a barrel. You know, I didn't know what a P&L was, didn't know what a balance sheet was, none of that stuff. Uh, but you fast forward 30 years and now I, you know, I'm in this industry where, you know, if you want to be a plumber, you go to, I think it's, you become a journeyman plumber. You go to school and you learn how to be a plumber. If you want to be an electrician, there's yeah. schooling that you have to have for an electrician and you get that you check the box and you're a licensed electrician. You can go and wire someone's home. If you want to be a painter, what do you do? Buy a paintbrush. 
you buy a paintbrush and you hope someone that will, someone will hire you and you learn on the job. It was yeah. just literally what I did. I was 19 years old. You guys should have seen the first house I painted. I, I still remember it today. And it, you know, the painter's term was there was flashing. It was terrible. I didn't know how to spray, but I, I learned. I learned on the job, on my customers' homes. And then what do we do as painting contractors? 99.9% .9 of us were like, oh, I, I need some more. I need an employee. I need two employees. I need three employees. We hire the employees. We take them to your house and we teach them how to paint at your house and we hope they don't screw it up too badly. <laughs> and we hope that we can fake it, that this guy knows what he's doing long enough that we can collect the paycheck and move on to the next one. That's literally what happens. Oh, yeah. So we decided, uh, it's been, it's been an evolution of the last couple of years. I decided, you know, we, we need to build a training center on site here. We need to train our guys and gals here on site the skills that we've been basically teaching them out in the field. So that's kind of where that birthed from. And, and Chris, you guys have both seen our training center, Brandon, you were here as well, right? Yeah. 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 Both of you guys were here. Yep. You've seen our training center. And I mean, it's literally, it looks like the outside of a house, there's siding, there's windows, there's even an air conditioner, there's the gas meter, there's the electrical boxes, there's everything that you, there's the plants. So we got to, we teach our guys, well, how do you cover a plant? No, you don't cover a plant with plastic when it's 90 degrees out, or you're going to be buying the customer a new plant. Uh, you don't cover the AC unit with plastic, or you're going to, you're going to burn up the, the pump and the AC, all of these things. We train them that here in house there's we have uh 12 modules that they go through they there's there's uh tests that they take written and verbal um and then once they check the boxes it's like okay yep i'm confident you have the skill sets you have the knowledge then they go out in the field and they start working on your home so that's that's the model that we started and we got some super exciting things coming guys we just poured a uh broke ground and poured the it's not a foundation because it's called a mono pour but anyway it's 140 foot by 70 foot the building is actually going to be bigger than the building we're in right now on the freeway yeah. wow. that's being built a month from now two months from now it's going to it's going to be up you'll see it and uh our training center is going to the, the training center we have now is going to be dwarfed by the one that we do have that we're going to have so wow. um you know, Chris, we've known each other for a long time. Uh, and, you know, I, I've, I kind of, uh, you know, go by the motto, if you're not growing, and I'll even ask my team at all of our all staff meetings, say, guys, if you're not growing, you're, and the whole team all in unison, you're dying, right? So we, we believe in, in, in growth. That's, that's, that's what we're about. And people ask me like, well, Tim, wh wh why do you do this? Why, wh why do you build a company to the size that you built it? Well, why wouldn't I? I, I if I'm not growing, I'm dying. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to stop growing until I'm dead. <laughs> yeah. Give us Tim. Live it out. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't mind, man, because I think it'll just help. We have a lot of listeners, you know, in the restoration industry, probably your your average restoration company, if you could find an average across the 50,000 or so, according to the census, uh, is probably between around a couple million bucks and then yeah. on up to five, some, some of the bigger companies, top 10% of the industry in that, you know, 20, 30 million dollar range. Can you give us an idea just your vitals like where is your company at now? No head count, number of employees. Yeah, without sharing exacts, we're on the higher end of the numbers that you just mentioned and we have uh over I think currently we're at like 110 employees. Uh, uh, I I could be off. It could be more than that. It could be less. Believe it or not, I'm I'm not in um, the trenches to that degree anymore. So I, unless I go and look at the board and look at uh, the numbers, I, I, I don't know at any given time how many employees we have. But, um, you know, everybody's why, you have to have a why. And my why 30 years ago was I wanted to make, I mean, I, I wanted to make $100,000 a year. That was my why. I mm -hmm. literally 30 years ago, I was a 19 year old kid. I thought, you know what? If I could make $100,000 a year, live in a nice house and drive a nice truck, I'm Life. good. Yeah. I'm good. Life, Life is good. Well, yeah. here I am 30 years later, and that why has completely changed 1000%. My why now is not about the money. It's not about building a company that Tim can put more money in his pocket. My why's changed. Now I've got 100, 110, whatever that number is, employees that I stand in front of every month, and I can look at them and I go, you know what? I'm part of your success. I'm providing a good job living wages for you. That's part of the why. And then I have management team 
that they have their why and they have their dreams. And so I'm able to, Tommy Mello actually said, um, make, how, how do you put it exactly? Make your dreams so big that everybody that works with you can fit their dreams inside your dreams. I love that. Yeah. And Tommy Mello, A1 Garage, look him up if you guys don't know who he is. Oh, this guy, yeah. oh, dude, next level. I, I know the guy personally. I text him probably more than he wants me to. <laughs> but, uh -huh. you know, so, so your why it, it morphs and it changes as as you grow. Mm. Yeah, it's it, what would you say was there some catalyst to that? Like, were there a, some milestone moments where not just because the business was growing and scaling, but something that happened, an experience that you're having that begin to shift this perspective or the vision that you had for the business? Were there any of those? Yeah, you know, I can't think of a specific. I, I probably could if I if I think long and hard, but I think more than just a catalyst moment, it's. You know, they say, you guys have heard, uh, if you want to be a millionaire, hang out with four other millionaires and sooner or later, you'll be the fifth one, right? So yeah. surrounding yourself with people that are better than you, smart, not better, but people that are smarter than you, that yeah. have gone further than you have, uh, I, I've I've done that. And I remember, I remember, bef you know, we before we invoiced $1 million, I remember talking to some guys that had, they, they had a million dollar a year company. It's like, you're doing a million dollars a year. Oh, you, you're doing that. I can do that too. And yeah. then you hit a million and you see guys that are doing three and yeah. you start hanging out with guys in the room. They're doing three and then five and then 10. And then it just exponentially grows. So hanging out with guys that have walked where yeah. you haven't walked for me is a motivator. I hang out with Tommy Mello, who's done, I think last year was like 250 million. No, yeah. that's, that's Honker. not going to be me. It's not going to be Fitzpatrick painting and construction. We're not growing this company to the level that a one garage door is, but being in a room with guys that they've taken it to the next level for me, anyway, it's motivating and yeah. it, and it, it, it causes me to want to continue driving and continue going forward. Because I mean, there was a, there was a time years ago, if you would have told my 19 year old self, Tim, you'll have a company that's valued at what it is today and, and, and invoices the numbers that you invoice today, I would have laughed at you. We said, yeah, no, no way. possible way. No possible way. Well, we're here. Yeah. So what's, yeah. what's my, what's my, my, my 59 year old self going to be looking back on my 49 year old self and saying, wow, you know what? Look, what, look, look where you guys are 10 years from now. Yeah. I hope I'd be, I hope I'll be laughing going, man, I never would have dreamt that. You know, one of the things I do remember about our visit, I mean, shoot, now this has been many years ago. Um, there was a general vibe from your leadership team. I remember uh, we had an exchange with at least a couple of them, I think. I think somebody was more on the sales side of things and then somebody was more operationally based. And it's been long enough now. I don't remember names, but there was a a, a real sense of loyalty like there was a um, kind of a commitment to the a little cultish, uh, actually. And it, and it stuck out to me because it was something at the time that we were uh, building and developing with the restoration company that we were that we were leading and, and building. And and so it just kind of always stood out in this thing of, man, he he somehow he was creating some sense of loyalty, this this getting people on board and excited about the mission as, as much as you are. And clearly that's worked in your favor because you're not in the trenches anymore. You're actually a business owner and you're not self-employed by any stretch of the imagination. What do you feel like were the one or two kind of principal actions or maybe posture that you held to create that and get that sense of loyalty and commitment early on by some of these leaders? Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting to hear you say that, Brandon, because honestly, I would, I would disagree with that. Um, really? I, I don't think, I don't think that I did build the loyalty and sense of commitment early on um, because I was too focused and too busy on just, I was running a business. Like I, I, I didn't like, you know, they say employees come first. The employees are the backbone of your business. Yeah. That's, that's, that's easy to say, but for someone to actually live that out and really truly take care of your employees and train your employees to the level of if they want to leave, they can, uh. But treat them well enough yes. to where they won't. That's that's the magic. And I feel like we're we're constant. We're still cracking the code. But I feel like just in the last few years, we've really cracked that code, and that's we've awesome. really started to embody the idea of 
take care of your employees. Make your employees feel it like they are number one. How are you going to make them feel like they're number one? By making them number one and allowing them to be number one and letting them know, like, I care about you, not just by what I say, but by my actions, whether that's me coming in on uh, Monday morning's crew lead breakfast, putting the apron on, cooking breakfast for my team, right? Or we have, I mean, there's so many things we do. I've got a, uh, where is it? It's right here. This, can this cord go this long? Uh, maybe I can reach. Have you guys seen one of these? The Rainmaker? No. I Dude, these things are so cool. You <laughs> fill it up with whatever denomination bills you want. You pull the trigger. And you nice. and you make it you make it rain, yeah. so very very often Tim makes it rain at our uh, our all staff meetings, and, and there are large bills that are in there. So you know I'm just <laughs> I'm just thinking of some of these things off the top of my head. You know their pay we pay our guys probably more than anybody else in the industry. I mean you know we give them ETO personal time off. We give them a 401k plan with a four percent match. We don't have to do those things. We give them health insurance, eighty percent coverage. All of these things that we do for our employees that. Sure, they could probably go to some other places and get some of that, yeah. but giving our giving our employees number one a, a, a working wage where you need to take care of them with with money. But if people think that just giving an employee a raise yeah. is going to keep them around, they got it one hundred percent wrong. Most people leave their job or quit their job not because they didn't get that dollar or two or three dollar an hour raise. They quit their job because they're sick and tired of the supervisor they worked for. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, you know it's interesting that you say that because I think in general, as as Chris was kind of setting the stage for today, you know, a you talking about the training and the training investment and commitment that you have. I mean, you, I'm, I was laughing myself the whole time because we're an industry that literally takes your house apart and tries to dry it and clean it in such a way that we don't expose people and family members to things they shouldn't be exposed to. High risk, high liability. And 99% of restoration companies do exactly what you do as a painting company or did, right? And that's send people out to your home and have them practicing these complex kind of things, right? And instead mm -hmm. of running them through more intentional training. So we're susceptible to that, obviously. But I think the other thing is too, is that you talking about this model of even a handful of years ago, you didn't feel like you were focused on that engagement, that loyalty, that commitment to the, uh, based on your employee, but what is it? What was in your head that you were fighting with? Because I know that our listeners are fighting that same fight right now, regardless. I mean, many of our listeners are above 20, 25, 30 million, and they're still fighting with this, this balancing act of how do I know that the investment I'm making in people is going to pay off? Like it is the right move, especially in the early phases when cash is a struggle. And you might really be thinking about that decision from the man, can I afford to invest this? Can I afford to give this much margin away? Like, how do you, can you just kind of walk us through some of that mental process that you were experiencing and how it kind of finally shook out? Yeah, I think, I think it's a fine line because, you know, when you're, when you're first starting out in business, the idea of, you know, having a rainmaker, for instance, with literally thousands of dollars in it at an employee, all staff, you're not going to do that. Yeah. You're trying to figure out how to make payroll. Yeah. Right. You're probably not going to be able to, maybe you can cook them bread. There are some things that you can do. You can go in and cook them breakfast. You could buy a several dozen eggs and buy a, you know, a, a cheap grill and, and cook them breakfast. So there are things you can do, but um, just, you know, having the mentality, I think what a lot of business owners, I, I shouldn't say that, what I'll, I'll speak for myself, right? What I've done for so many years is I had the mentality that the customer comes first. Oh, the customer doesn't come first. I'm sorry for any of my customers that are listening, but you come second. My employees come first. We have to take care of our employees. We have to invest the time and you have to pay them what they want to be, not what they want to be paid. Some, sometimes, sometimes what they want to be paid, it's like, dude, you might want to go back <laughs> yeah, to college too. and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but you've got to be investing in your employees. If we, if we, if we don't invest in our employees and we just invest in our customers, what makes us think that our employees are going to go out to our customer's home and invest in them? They're not. But if we invest in our employees and our employees are taken care of, it's real easy for them to go to our customer's homes and take care of our customers as well. 
So it all trickles down. But I think as business owners, we get stuck in this rut of, well, I don't want to pull out the rainmaker. I don't want to cook the breakfast. I don't want to uh, hand out the bonuses. I don't want to have the quarterly parties, the 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 um, tacos and beer Friday, or you know, all these different things because that costs money. Yes, it does. But if you spend the money and with that the time on your employees, that's going to reap tenfold and how your employees are going to treat your customers, how they're going to treat you when they do get the call for the other job offer. They're going to, yeah, I appreciate the fact that you're offering me $2 an hour more, but I really like it over here. The grass really is greener. Just like it says on our billboard, (laughs) the grass is greener on the other side. (laughs) Which, by the way, I don't want to get a spun out on it, but dude, you are the master of billboards. There's like (laughs) two companies that we know the owners of. Yours is one and Ironhead is the other where I'm like, these guys have got a grip on billboards and they are leveraging it to the max. You know, I, th- for years, I think Paul's got me beat. Paul's got me beat. <laughs> oh, he, yeah, he might at this point, but yeah. So, okay. Another, another track I had, cause it's so relevant across all the service sectors is how, how do you recruit people? I mean, because you're, you're in a, I would think you're in a somewhat seasonal business, although you guys have diversified now you have construction services. You obviously do, uh, you know, interior painting and so forth, which I would imagine helps bolster the work in the winter months, but still a fairly seasonal business, right? Like how, how do you find people? Does your training system robust enough at this point to where you can hire a greenhorn who's never touched a paintbrush and how quickly can you get that? Like how, how do you make that work year in yeah. year out? It's, it's a, it's a dance. It's a, find balance every year because we are seasonal we we're a seasonal company no matter what yes we offer interior we do a ton of interior work we have our construction division which by the way a little plug for fitzpatrick painting and construction a lot of folks don't realize just how big our construction division is we have seven crews out there all the time doing anything from windows deck siding small additions remodels uh fences you name it the whole gamut uh dry rot repair but Every year there's layoffs. We will not have 110 or wherever we're at employees right now in December. Uh, We hope that we'll have, I don't know what that number is. Is it 60? Is it 70? Is it 80? I don't know, but it's not going to be what it is. So we're cons every year we lay off and then every year we rehire. We hope to be able to bring some of those guys back, but a lot of those guys, they move on. Um, our, Our team members, they know when we hire them, we let them know that we we don't keep you based on your tenure, how long you've been here. We keep you based on your productivity and based on your, you know, are you a company man? Are you a company woman? We keep the best. I like this term and hate it at the same time, but we keep the best and we fire the rest, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, yeah. but as far as the recruiting piece, we, we have a full-time recruiter. Uh, she says recruiting and HR, but one of her roles is recruiting, is getting those bodies in, doing the interviews, processing them all the everything that goes all the, the back end that goes into that and then our training system yes we are at the level now chris where our training center we can literally take someone and within two weeks if they have the skill sets uh that are required and they have the the, the i mean some folks you bring them in and it's like oh yeah you, you just there's no hand eye there's no hand eye you they you know they they they, they think they're going to be comfortable on a ladder but they get on the second rung and they're <laughs> gripping on for dear life and I, uh, you know, so, but, but we find that out here in the training center, not, not at their home, but it, it's, it's a, it's a balance, Chris. It's always a juggling act. I, what I'm hoping my, my vision for Fitzpatrick painting and construction is that I believe that we have a really good culture here, but I'd be lying to you if I told you that I thought our culture was just amazingly awesome. It's not, it's great. My vision is that our culture will be so awesome that we will literally have, we'll be turning people away. Mm -hmm. My recruiter that we use in the summertime, she'll be doing other things because we won't even need that because we'll have so many people that know just how good it is at Fitzpatrick that they're going to be, they'll be lining up out our door to come to work for us. That's my vision. That's, that's where I want to take this. And I know that we can do that. You know, let's, if you're cool with that, I want to hang in that for a minute because I, I think one kudos to you that that is the vision. I think one of the struggles that we see with, with a lot of organizations and I, I fall prey to this too in our own business is we just get so consumed with the doing that we begin to lose, uh, 
our grip on what our real role as the owner of the entrepreneur is. And that is creating this vision for where we're heading and aligning people towards that common cause. But like, as you say that, like you critiquing your existing culture now and you saying one day it's going to be this, define it for me. What does that look like? What are the missing pieces from your perspective right now to get you to that next tier? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. And I wish I could answer that. Um, if I knew exactly what those miss pe missing pieces were and are, I could literally plug them in in the next couple of weeks and we'd be there. Um, I think probably the biggest piece that's missing is, you know, we get, we get busy in the busyness, right? And we get busy yeah. in just running the business and all of the things that go along with running a business. But for me, as my role, you know, I, I'm basically tasked with one of the things I'm tasked with is I, I train the trainers, right? Okay. So I'm, I'm the coach of my, my CEO, my CFO, my CMO, all these guys that sit in these higher level seats, my HR manager, right? So being able to coach them in such a way and allow them to be able to run in such a way that they can um, treat our employees, uh, re attract our employees in such a way that our uh, folks are like, hey, I want to go to Fitzpatrick. We're not we're not there yet, and I wish I had that secret sauce. But I think it starts with, I know it starts with letting your your employees need to know. Again, I'm going back to what I already said. I think, but your employees need to know that you care, and they're never going to know that by us telling them that. Hmm. I can tell you I care about you until I'm blue in the face, but unless I actually show you through my actions that I truly care. It's nothing more than words. And yeah. so our actions need to speak louder than our words, right? And we need to, our employees need to know by our actions, by all of those little things, it's not just one thing. It's not the rainmaker. It's not the breakfast. It's not the quarterly uh, uh, all staff parties that we have or the casino night or the the, the pinnacle trip that we have where we're taking to them. And I, I stole that from, who did I steal that from? I think that was from Tommy as well. Tommy, sorry, if you're listening to this, I steal a lot of stuff from you. Um, but the pinnacle trip where we're taking like the best of the best of our employees to Phoenix and we're going to put them up in a five star hotel and take them to the hopefully the best dinner that they've ever had in their life. You know, we're going to treat them like just give, it's going to be bougie. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. My, my teenage kids gave me that term too, bougie. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the things we learn from our kids. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's I, I don't I don't have it. I haven't cracked the code. Yeah. Uh, but I'm I'm going to keep fighting until that code gets cracked. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I love that. You know, one of the things that um, we've seen, I think a lot of teams uh, kind of lean into, and once they do, it's it's very interesting, the result that it begins to create. And that's this idea that part of showing our people that we care about them is a commitment around establishing systems and processes. You know, it's not just all the, you know, the rainmakers and the breakfast, like all of that, obviously, from a relationship perspective, so impactful, but there's also just this kind of more utilitarian raw business aspect that when we really dial in systems and processes, that's also part of the way that we show our people that we care about them, we equip them, we make them confident by the things that we put in place, uh, you know, in order to make them more successful. What, what's your perspective on that? And what do you feel like some of the things that you guys have done, if you do agree with it, that you've leaned into to, to kind of see that happen? I agree 1000% with that. Um, why, why do you think it is that McDonald's mm -hmm. can serve you a hamburger anywhere in the world and that hamburger is cooked exactly the same? You can order a hamburger in Albany, Oregon, or you can order a hamburger in Albany, New York, or anywhere in between, and it'll taste exactly the same. It's through their SOPs, their yeah. standard operating procedures and their systems and their processes. They've cracked that. So have and their employees, you, you basically, instead of your employee having to think for themselves and you have for us, you know, 110 or whatever it is, 110 employees running around trying to figure out like, okay, well, what is the best way for me to do this? They have the Fitzpatrick way and it simplifies everything. And then everybody's reading from the same Bible and they're not tasked with, I have to write my own Bible. And I might forget how I did it last week. Now, how do I want to do it this week? I'm sure that causes a lot of internal stress. Could you imagine if McDonald's hired however many 
hundreds of thousands of employees they had and they just you know brought him in and like showed him how to cook a hamburger and then it's like all right we'll just do it Good you luck. know like yeah. can you imagine what we would get uh it's kind of funny i actually remember there was another painting contractor this is another squirrel that's going in front of the screen here but there was another painting contractor won't mention um who he is uh and he actually put an article. It was in the Gazette Times, Chris. This yeah. where we write. This is back when people actually still got the newspaper. That's how long this was. And he referred to Fitzpatrick painting and construction as the McDonald's. And it was kind of a slam, but I took it as a compliment. You're like, like wow, this, thank you so yeah. much. Like, no joke. so yeah. yeah. Systems and processes are key. We do not, and being completely transparent, we do not have an SOP for every anything and everything in our company. We don't. We need to if we want to take this from where we're at now to the next next level we that's the one thing that we have to get dialed in is our sops have to be just on point for everything yeah. everything you know what's cool I, I'm, I'm gonna i'm totally bogarting the entire conversation but i think what's cool about hearing you say that and i think it's a good reminder for myself i think it's a good reminder for a lot of the teams that are listening again we've got teams that are being very successful monetarily if you look at top line bottom line they're crushing and if you look at them in context of you know, many of the businesses in our industry and kind of the service sector at large, they're doing really well. And I think they forget that there's still this opportunity to reinvest time and energy and strategy time into creating the systems and processes, developing SOPs. It's a fairly unsexy part of the work, right? For most of us. I mean, some nerd out on it and it's great, but but for many of us, it's just, it's a hard commitment to make and it's hard time to invest because it feels like you're putting money and energy into something and it's hard to see the outcome right away. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I'm just really encouraged mm -hmm. hearing a guy like you, we didn't, we don't have hard numbers on your business. Clearly you're in a top tier, you're doing very well and, it, and continue to grow. And to hear you saying there's this recommitment to, and uh, you know, this, you've got to make sure that you're looking at it and it is required to continue to go to the next level. It's just a solid reminder, I think, mm. for all of us in our yeah, hundred percent businesses. So yeah, yep. along those same lines, man, I'm I'm curious if we could pivot slightly uh, and kind of continue on this path of like systems and processes and 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 that sort of thing. You know, we end up spending a lot of time with clients helping them identify like their metrics and KPIs in their business, right? This idea of leading the business from the numbers, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm curious about your thoughts on that and how that's evolved for you over the years. And in the painting business, I, I have a, a number of friends who did either um, college pro or college works painting businesses in college and so forth. And one of my buddies in particular, he told me about his first summer and made a bunch of top line and made almost zero profit, right? Because of mishaps and his team doing crazy things and breaking windows and falling through roofs and just all kinds of crazy stuff, right? So it's possible, obviously, to, to be fantastically successful selling and at the end of the day, have very little to show for it, right? So what, what are those metrics or KPIs that you lead from and your team leads from? In the, what are you watching in terms of yeah. your profitability and so forth? Yeah. Uh, that's a good question, Chris. And I agree with you a, a thousand percent. I, so I have a coach, I've had a coach. And if you, if you're a small business owner and you don't have a coach, get one, right? Could you imagine somebody playing basketball or football or whatever it is at a high level and not having a coach? It simply doesn't happen. So you should have a coach in your corner. If you don't have one, get one. Uh, I remember my coach telling me I've been with, I've been with Brian now for 16 or 17 years. And I remember Brian telling me, Tim, the numbers tell a story. And it was just like in this year and out that year, right? Because I'm not a numbers guy. I'm not a, I, like I told you earlier, I didn't, I didn't know what a p &L was. I didn't know what a balance sheet was. I didn't know what any of that was. I just literally shot from the hip. But you have to look at your numbers. You have to know top line. Yes, of course you have to know top line. But you got to know what's your gross profit? What's your, bot, what, what's your bottom line? What are you spending on marketing? If you don't know those numbers, then you it, it, it can work. And it worked for me very well because I just had this innate instinct and somehow managed to make things work at a smaller level. If we were still doing that at the numbers we're running today, it would be a complete mess. But uh, another thing too, you know, I, I hear a lot of guys and they, you know, talk about top line. Oh, I'm a $20 million a year company. I'm 30 million. I'm 40 million. I'm 10, I'm 50, whatever it is. Oh, that's nice. I know guys in my circle, other painting contractors, not in Oregon. I'm thinking of one specifically, and they did $40 million last year. Guess what their net profit was? Less oh. than 1%. Wow. Less than 1%. So you know, a lot of folks get hung up on this. And it's like, you know, we want to show our badge. Oh, I'm a 10 million. I'm a 20 million. I'm a 30. That's great. That's nice. 
let me go all the way down to the bottom and let's see what you're making. Because you could make, I think we could all agree, you can make $100 million top line. And if you spent $101 million, your life's going to suck because you just lost a million bucks, right? But if you make a million dollars, a hundred million dollars top line, and you manage to keep 20% net profit, you just make $20 million, right? So a lot of guys get hung up on that. And like, you know, they just, I, I, you know, 20 million, 30 million, 40 million. You got to know your numbers though. Mm-hmm. You got to know what, what, what what's coming in the door, obviously. You got, and you got to know what's staying on the table, how much of that money is staying on the table. And I think for small business owners too, especially of a lot of the, like the, the bucket and we call them bucket and brush. I don't know if that's EC, but you know, the, the bucket and brush guys. Uh, and I was one of those, um, you know, I, I, I drove a, a, a nice truck and, and I was able to buy my first home, but I had no idea about my finances. And I was not, maybe not necessarily living paycheck to paycheck, but pretty stinking close to that. Cause I had no clue. And going from a bucket and brush or what a lot of small business owners do is they literally, they just go from one job to the next. And it's like, wow, I just deposited a hundred thousand dollars in my bank account. I'm, I've got to be doing really good when they don't realize that. Yeah, but you have $110,000 that's, that's on AP wow. accounts payable. You're not doing good. Right. But they just keep rolling that through and somehow they magically make it work and they have a job. They don't, they're not a business owner. Yeah. Their business owns them. Yeah, exactly. They, they, they just, and instead of working 40 hours a week, they work 80 hours a week. Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hence the, the nightmare that we uh, get sucked into by, by accident. Do you, do you feel like, so this is very interesting. So you obviously not your natural instinct. This is something that you've had to flex into and develop competency in for the success of your business. What do you, what do you do to kind of like, um, I guess in the earlier phases when not all of that was hired out or delegated, how did you make that transition? Was there kind of a mindset that you had to hold on to as you're starting to do hard things uh, versus what you're naturally wired for to get that transition to happen? There was a transition and that was simply hiring people that are smarter than me. And I know that's not the answer you're looking for, but that's, that's, that's the truth. I, I still, I understand numbers, but I hate numbers. I mean, I've got my call once a month with my with my coach, and we look at the P and L, and my eyes start glazing over. Sure, I understand what you said, but I hate it. I I will never love the minutia of numbers. I will never love the minutia of writing an SOP. I hate it. I'm a visionary. I love building, creating, looking at things. You know, the marketing. I love the marketing piece. But so I I hired guys that were smarter than me because I'm not a numbers guy. That's why I have a CFO and she looks at all of our numbers and I don't have to worry about any of that. And early on when you can't, you know, I'm in a, a brand new business owner, they're not going to have a CFO and they're not going to have a CEO and you know, not going to have all of these these C suites filled, but you can still have some and if you if you don't have the ability to have someone on your team, you're you're going to have to do. I mean, I did some of the dirty work myself. Yeah. I did pay attention to the numbers, probably not like I should have back then, uh, but I still paid attention to those, but if you're going to be a successful small business owner, you either A, have to do some of that dirty work yourself that you don't like doing, or B, you have to bring someone in that can help you with that. Because a lot of small business owners, the majority of us, right, we decided to go into business because we were either A, a good painter, a good roofer, a good carpenter, fill in the blank with whatever else. We were good at our trade. And so we said, oh, I'll go into business for myself. Yeah. But because you're a good tradesman, that doesn't make you a good businessman. Right. And I think that's why reason a lot of small businesses fail because they're like, oh, I'm the best carpenter in the world. And they go out there and it's like, well, how come this isn't working for me? Because you know absolutely nothing about running a business, nothing about numbers. And you've got more in accounts payable than you have in accounts receivable and you're just bleeding. I love the I love the the uh the whole thing of how many times businesses are started from the perspective of somebody caught wind of what the total contract value was and versus what they're getting paid. And they're instantly like, I can do better, right? We've had so many uh, trades team members throughout the years from our different restoration companies, you know, kind of get this vision of grandeur of, oh man, I'm going to go out and double my income because I can just pay, you know, I, I'll make all the money and the, inevitably we get a knock on the door of this didn't go exactly the way I had <laughs> planned. You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> hundred percent. We, we used to operate by, I would, I'll call it a closed book and we didn't share with our employees. They didn't know what we were making. And it was 
so comical because most employees, if you don't actually give them like just basic 101 and show them this is what we're making, they will assume like you're doing a $10,000 job. Tim's got to be putting at least five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars of that in his pocket because he only paid me, you know, thirty dollars. What they just do this, yep. whatever math in their head, and they always think that it is way better than what it actually is. Oh yeah. Uh, so, and I, I think that that's actually one of the things that probably has helped with um, our our retention with some of our employees. Because we've got a lot. You guys know we live in the same town here, right? But I mean, there's a lot of painting companies out there. Sure. I used to work for Fitzpatrick and that's all fine. It's all well and good. Um, but, you know, since we've been sharing our numbers with our employees and they can see exactly what comes in and then what stays in and how much goes out and where it goes out, I think it gives them a better understanding of this is actually what it takes to run a business. You don't just go get a contractor's license, slap your name on a truck, put an ad on, you know, now social media it used to be the yellow pages, right? Yeah. Uh, the, you've got to work at it. And there's a lot of stuff that's involved with this. That's why we, I mean, you know, we had, uh, we had two guys, two guys this year that started their own business and both of them, they were, one of them was about eight months. The other one was about a year and a half and they both came back. Yeah. So you know what? The grass actually is greener over there, Tim. This isn't what I thought it was going to be. So yeah, that uh, whole GNA is, uh, that's a scary zone. If you're not, if you're not aware of what all starts to happen under those, those cost codes, you know, it, as far as like, do you mind, you don't have to give hard numbers, obviously, but do you mind kind of sharing? What is that? How do you report on that? And how much, uh, how much transparency do you have? Yeah. What does that look like? Is that finance? part of the all yeah. meeting or yeah. what you so we, and we don't do, we don't do it every month, but so we'll give them, they'll, they'll know what, what our, uh, uh, what, the, what the, what the job size is that all of the gross profits. So what our guys see is they see the dollar amount. They know what we charge for every single job. They'll see the gross profit, right? They'll know what that number is after uh, labor, direct cost of goods sold. All, after all that's plugged in, they'll know the, 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 um, the gross profit on that. And then we actually haven't complete transparency with you guys. It's been, gosh dang, it's probably been over a year. This is something I got to put on my list of things to do. This conversation is good. Just gave me more work. We haven't in over a year shared with our team. We used to share everything below the gross profit as well, but it's literally been over a year now that I'm thinking back since we've done that. But we'll share with them marketing expenses. This is how much we pay for marketing on this. This is how much we pay for vehicles. All those vehicles sitting out there. Oh yeah. my gosh. This And, and we we lightly share a lot of that stuff. Like even at the last meeting, I was thinking, you know, I shared with the guys uh, that I had just invested over $200,000 in vehicles. Sure. I didn't literally write the checks, you know, they're fine. You know, we would be, wouldn't be a good business owner if we went out and wrote a check for 200 grand for a business. There's a lot of reasons why you should either lease those or finance them rather than writing a check, whether you have the money in the bank or not. But uh, mm -hmm. we share a lot of that stuff with, with our team, but having this conversation with you guys is reminding me, I'm not sharing as much with them as I have in the past, but we used to share all of it and they, they should know like, okay, you did a $10,000 job. Wow. You only, you only kept a thousand dollars on the table for that job or 2000 or whatever that number ended up being. They yeah. need to know that. Yeah. I actually, I think the, the fact that you pointed towards the, the element that this actually can be a retention factor is very interesting. Mm. I, I think that we see, a lot of times there's this disconnect between leadership and downline, and it's mainly based on assumptions and a lack of information, right? It's it's rarely like malicious intent. It's just this, we start to spin a story if we don't really have the details. And the less details we have, the more room we have to spin a story. And often that story is A, riddled with not truth. And it it often takes us into a position that's not super healthy or or builds unity or commitment, um, and it's funny because I feel like when we've talked about transparency and financials with most business owners, they're really afraid to to do that. I mean, and and I don't know, I, I can understand. I mean, in, even in our business, there's certain elements where I'm like, I don't love sharing uh, every element of of the detail, but I think the more transparent you can be, it just takes some of the mystery out of it. And now all of a sudden they don't think you're buying new Corvettes every Saturday, uh, but that you're actually all, a lot of that money is going back into the entity, into the business to do the things like you say, uh, show our people we care about them, right?
I yep. mean, do you have anything to say about that? Like, was there a little bit of a mental gymnastics that you did as you started to become more transparent with your finances? Oh, oh yeah, a thousand percent. I remember back in the day, I used to tear, and this is when we were still using paper contracts, I would tear the bottom edge of the contract off before I handed it to my employees because I didn't want them to know what we charged for the job. Because I had this mental block in my head, like if if they know what I'm charging for the job, they're gonna they're gonna paint the story that's fictional. Yes, that is true. They're going to. And if we don't educate our employees and we don't share with them some basics of the numbers, you don't have to get into the weeds. But if they don't have a rough idea of what it's taking to run the company, they're going to paint their own story. And I guarantee you, 10 times out of 10, your numbers are going to be way better than what they actually are. And you're going to be making way more money than what you actually are. That's the story they're going to create. So yeah. do you, do you a want to create a real story that has real numbers or B let your employee create this fictitious story that makes you out to be this guy that's got millions and millions of dollars just sitting around at his disposal. Because I don't care if you're running a, a, a million dollar business or if you're running a $40 million business, you don't have millions and millions of dollars sitting in the bank at your disposal, right? You, it, it takes a lot of money to run a business. That building that we're putting up in the, in the back here, that costs money, right? Everything does. And if for our employees to be able to hear that, like, oh, okay, great. But, and they also need to hear that the company is healthy. They need to yeah. know that. Yeah. If you're working for a company and the company's not profitable, that's not a good place to be. You might want to look for another job because that yeah. company may or may not be in business tomorrow. But working for a company that, yes, I know this company is profitable. And I also know that this company invests back in both to the employees and in the company, whether it's a new building, whether it's new vehicles, whether it's training, a training center, you name it, fill in the blank, they're investing in the company. Well, now you've got part of that magic sauce, right? Because now the employees, they have that sense of security and they know that Tim's just not out there buying brand new Corvettes on the weekends, but he's actually taking that money and he's investing into the company. And oh yeah, I work for that company. Yeah. Yeah. That's wise. I, I think there's profound relational impact when we're just more honest about what we're doing, why we're doing it and how it impacts those that are on the boat with us. Um, it's not easy to do mentally, but I just think the value in it long term is it's wise. I just think there's a ton of wisdom associated yep. with it. Yeah, hundred percent. We've covered a lot of ground. This has been really fun, man. As, as we kind of uh, get ready to land the plane, um, I got a couple. I got a few just more, um, I guess, curious questions for you. We have a big audience of business owners, and so I think it's always fun. We always get great feedback when we have owners on. Uh, for these kind of conversations. And so if I can hit you with some, uh, some uh, kind of questions here at the very end, the first one I have is you mentioned Tommy Mello, but what are some other learning resources, mentors, public figures, maybe that you follow that you derive a lot of inspiration from maybe podcasts you listen to or books that you're reading, that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I listen to uh, Tommy Mello. Um, it's uh, Home Service Freedom. I listen to his podcast. I actually listen to, and this isn't what this podcast is about at all, but I listen to a lot of real estate guys because I, I think, Chris, maybe you know, I, I've got a passion for real estate. So I listen to uh, Brandon Turner, Bigger Pockets, um, uh, Tony, uh, no, um, oh my goodness, Ryan Pineda uh, out of Vegas. I, I listen to a lot of stuff that Ryan puts out. Um, I also listen to, um, Oh my goodness, his name just left me. He's the number one. I think he's the the number one public speaker in the world right now. Um, gosh dang it, guys! I'm so sorry. Completely. It's uh, oh, yeah, I'm curious. Yeah. Yeah. Um, What's Tommy's piece again? Tommy Mello, uh, Home yeah. Service Freedom. Freedom. That's right. It's um, where's my podcast? There they are. Oh, that was Ed Milet. Oh yeah. Oh sure. Yeah. Okay. Everybody knows who Ed Milet is. I I I love Ed Milet. You either love him or, or not, but I I love Ed Ed Milet's material. Um. Yeah. The wealthy wealthy way. That's that's the 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 one from Ryan Pineda. But his podcast is called Wealthy Way. Contractor Evolution is another good one. Mm -hmm. Um. Haven't listened to their podcasts for for quite a while, but I, I, I they're they're on here and I used to listen to their stuff. Um. Just going through here. That's a good Contractor Revolution. Contractor evolution. Mm. Yeah, right on. Yep. 
You know, uh, you know, another thing too is business owners start to become more successful and they've got more leftover money at the end of the year. One of their biggest problems becomes taxes. And uh, so if you could leave one tax tip that you've discovered over the years that's had the biggest impact on your overall uh, wealth and personal income, how, what, like, what would that be? Anything stand out? Yep. Buy real estate and do cost segregation on your real estate. Yeah. Uh-huh. I, I feel like we just had a five second segment with Paul. There you go. Yeah. Paul. Yeah. So our, our, I know Paul would say the Paul same thing. Yeah, yeah. 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 Do you, do you mind just giving us the 15 second kind of definition? What are you talking about there in case <laughs> somebody hasn't heard about it before? Uh, you better talk to Paul to get the intelligence. So I, <laughs> I cost segregation. I honestly couldn't even explain how it works, but th- th- basically what, what they do is so say you have a property that's valued at a million dollars. They'll, 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 they'll cost out however they do it and they'll figure out how much money you can essentially put in the bucket that's tax deferred that you don't have to pay taxes on that property. So we just had cost segregation on, I had on all of my properties, but just on the building here alone, I forget what the number was, but I think it was over $200,000 that my cost seg guy, it's the same guy that Paul was actually the one that referred me to this guy. Um, but I, I can't speak intelligently about it. I really can't. That's why I literally write the check and have someone do it for me. All yeah. that I know is that those numbers save me literally hundreds of thousands of dollars on taxes. But yeah. taxes is one of those things like, it's kind of a catch 22. If you want to make money, you've got to pay tax. So there's no magic bullet. If you're making money, you're paying taxes. So yeah, I made a bunch of money. I had to pay a bunch of taxes. That's a lot of people. That's a terrible thing. Is it a terrible thing? The alternative is don't make any money and don't pay any taxes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah there right. is. A, right. But cost the seg. The yang. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the short answer is, is buy real estate and cost seg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, my limited understanding of this, and we actually, that reminds me, we should get Paul. Yeah, we need to talk Paul about it. It'd be super fun. Seg, yeah. But the idea is, let's say you buy that million dollar piece of property, they're going to separate the dirt from the improvement in, in terms of its value. And then basically there's a rapid depreciation model that you're able to recognize on the improved property. So not the dirt, but but on the facilities, the buildings. And that's where you get some really ridiculous numbers yeah. um, that you're able to, to let yeah. in your favor. It's really powerful stuff. The offset income, yeah. Yeah, yeah they're separating I mean, literally the light bulbs. They're, they're figuring out how much is this uh, guy going to spend on light bulbs for the next 10 years. And they're, they're costing that into the, the number, all of it. It's super cool. Is there a certain category of real estate that you like in particular that you've been more successful in? I like multifamily. Uh, no, okay. you do. Yep. yep. Nice. And do you like to uh, to jump in and invest with other people or do you like to invest solo? I invest solo. There's so many different uh, ways to invest in real estate. I actually belong to a, a real estate mastermind. Um, and everybody in my group, we all have our, you know, one guy's doing syndication, one guy's doing uh, short-term rentals. I have one short-term rental, but it's not it's not what I do. Um, you know, one guy's doing multifamily, another guy's doing commercial. There's so many ways to invest in real estate. Um, I wouldn't want, if, if, if you're someone and you're listening to this podcast, and you have some excess money sitting around and you want to invest in real estate, but you don't know how to do that. Or maybe you don't, you know, I've got all of the resources right at my fingertips. I've got, you know, a construction company and a painting company. So that mm-hmm. makes it pretty, pretty easy for me to buy a piece of property and then go out there and fix it up and, and, and force the appreciation on that property rapidly. If you're someone that doesn't have that, but you do have some cash sitting in the bank, I would say find some other partners and do a syndication, do, do a joint venture with some of these other guys. Um, there's a lot of money to be made in that. Uh, arena as well. I've just never played in that arena. Um, so for me, it's been, it's been the multifamily. I buy, I buy fixer uppers. They just happen to be multifamily. And then we fix them up and we hold on to them and buy the next one. Well, it's, it. it's so smart when you're in the trades, right? When you have a restoration company, a construction crew, you've got great relationships with subs. I mean, that's a, that's a huge resource, <laughs> you know, in terms of being able to cost effectively, uh, remodel and renovate um, that your typical real estate investor often doesn't have, right? So that, yeah, that's neat. Okay. I got a final one. Yeah. Cool yeah, wrap yeah, up? yeah. Yeah. Final question for you, Tim. If you had the one thing that you would pass on to somebody that's in their growth trajectory, let's say they're three, 4 million, they're headed to 10, 15 um, over the next five years. What's the one thing that had you paid attention to this earlier it may have been able to speed up the progress that you've had with your business. The one thing that would have sped up the progress of my business is if, if I would have paid attention to my numbers earlier, that would have helped put me on the trajectory much, much quicker. But the one thing that I would have done is, and I mentioned this earlier, I think I would have got a business coach. 
If you're in business and you don't have a business coach, I don't care if you're doing $100,000 a year or $100 million, get a business coach. Mm. If you want to be successful and you want to perform well, you need a coach, period. It, it, what's the what's the why? What What is it? What do you feel like is the real value that they're bringing to that relationship for you? Well, yeah, I, I, for most of us, I mean, if, if you're if you're a business owner and you know all the answers and you've got it all figured out and you know marketing, uh, you know you know your P and L, you know your balance sheet, you know how to everything that goes into a business, you've got all that figured out, then yeah, you probably don't need a business coach because you know how to do it. You don't need anybody to help you. But if you're like the rest of us and you don't have it all figured out and you could actually have somebody in your arena that either A has walked that before or B has the has the 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 wherewithal the intelligence to be able to kind of see things from an outside you know the 30,000 foot not in the trenches because us business owners we're in our business we're in it we we own it it's our it's our baby but having a coach that it's it's not their business they see things that you don't see because they're stepped back and they can see kind of a broader bigger picture so, I mean, there's so many reasons why you, why you need to have a coach. Again, going back to athletics, I think we would all agree that it would be absurd for anybody. I was actually watching the Olympics and sorry, total squirrel here, but I was watching ping pong. Did you guys know that ping pong is in the Olympics? <laughs> <Yeah>. Crazy. <laughs> I got sucked into watching ping pong. It's like the most boring, but yet not <laughs> boring. I'm like, I'm like ping pong and they have coaches they're a ping pong player and they got coaches so it doesn't matter what the sport is yeah. these guys have coaches in their corner that are helping them perform at the best level that they can perform at even the silly ping pong players yeah, <laughs> I, I like ping it. pong i've got a ping pong table but yeah. i love it i feel like we we owe you now because you just pitched uh consulting for us really well better than we can but just yeah. to attest to what you're saying we have one and it's one of the the biggest turns that we've had in our business this year yeah. is is that we followed our own our own lead and and we have one to help us guide us where we're headed and think about things from 30,000 feet it's very powerful yeah so totally yeah that's awesome well tim man this has been really fun dude it's been fun to reconnect and i'm glad you're doing well and uh best of luck as you continue growing your business and um thanks for joining us today man appreciate it thanks you. thanks chris thanks brandon i appreciate it this has been fun i had no idea what to expect you asked me to be on the podcast like Great. I've literally came straight from the gym. I got my workout clothes on. And you guys, are you, like the lighting, you guys are in like this cool studio with perfect lighting and all. And then there's me. I got like this <laughs> bright light shining on my forehead and a deer antler in the back. And I got I got to step up my game, man. I got I to gotta get the right lighting. So maybe I could look halfway as good looking as you guys do on camera. <laughs> hey, that's that's your next uh, horizon, man. You just double the size of your business and start a podcast. You'll be okay. There you there go. You go. Yeah. All right. Appreciate you guys. Yeah. Okay. Be well. Uh, Thanks. Bye -bye.